welcome to our Play Well podcast series. My name is Marguerite Hunter Blair, and I am Chief Executive of Play Scotland, the national organisation for play. Today, we'll look at how to consult with children and young people on their local area. Jenny is a trained town planner who completed a PhD on children's human rights and the Scottish town planning system in 2016. She is a founding member of the Scottish charity A Place in Childhood, or APIC for short. Here is our Learning and Development Officer, Jenny Lester, catching up with Dr Jenny Wood. Hi Jenny, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Could you please introduce yourself and say a little bit about what play means to you? Hi Jenny, thanks for having me on. So my background really is that I was a town planner by training. So that was um, what I chose to do my degree in when I kind of left school and things. So it's always been something that's of been of a lot of interest to me, but um, I never really went down the kind of the standard sort of town planning track. In the end, I sort of finished up my degree and got really interested in research. So then I, I started thinking about, well, you know, what what is it that... Um, you know, really interests me about kind of planning and kind of how we can make places better. And the key thing that had sort of occurred to me through various bits of work, like working with um, PADS on doing some engagement with children and things, it, it sort of struck me as really quite strange that we don't see children and young people out and about on our street and that they really don't have very much independence. So I started looking into this and then ended up doing a PhD on children's rights in the Scottish town planning system. And that's kind of where I've ended up sort of today. So um, in my PhD, I was looking at um, children's right to play and also children's right to participate in the matters that affect them. Um, as well as kind of their right to just sort of gather and be in space. But because the result was basically that the planning system isn't really set up to do that um, and that there's quite a lot of work that needs to be done after doing that, it felt to me and it felt to other people that I knew as well that had come from slightly different um, sort of training perspectives that rather than just having a a piece of research that, to be honest, no one really wants to read. No one reads a thesis um, (laughs) beyond the people that have written it and have been involved, and it doesn't change things. So I kind of got really interested in, well, how do we actually make this change happen? Um, And that led me on to found um, an organisation called A Place in Childhood. So we work with children and young people to kind of help them understand kind of what changes they want to see in their communities and then help to try and make that happen. So a lot of what we look at is kind of what makes a child or a young person friendly environment um, and then what kind of children's priorities and how can we kind of work together to include them better in our built environment and in kind of other services and policies where they're often excluded. That sounds so interesting, Um, especially that sort of move from research, okay, here's the problem, to how do we solve that? And I think lots of people would be asking, well, what does planning have to do with play? You know, like what I don't, those two things seem so far apart in most people's heads. So I was wondering if you could say a bit about that. Yeah, sure. I think you're right. And I think that's part of the problem is that kind of planning. So planning is about kind of everything about how we structure our environments and different land uses and what we do and don't prioritize in spaces. But we're also often a bit blind to it. We don't think about, oh, that exists in our environment because someone actually made a decision for it to be there. Um, So a lot of it we kind of take for granted. So, you know, things like um, the fact that we have roads with lots of cars on and we have playgrounds where we keep the children and we have schools where we keep the children and and children kind of get driven around um, or, you know, buildings have been there for a really long period of time. We don't know how they got there. So there's a lot about planning that I think we sort of take for granted and don't realise that it's the result of lots of decisions over time. Some of them kind of conscious, some of them actually a kind of an unconscious decision about what we do and don't prioritize. So I think when it comes to um, planning and play, I think the key thing is that we have uh, kind of historically created environments that favor efficiency and favor kind of movement and adult priorities. And so when it comes to children, as I said, we have the playground kind of, you know, we, we pen off a land use where children can be children because in many ways, otherwise children present a bit of a problem for planning because they're not they're not children playing out and about isn't necessarily efficient for like us moving around and us getting on with adult activities but obviously it's essential um to our development to our health to um you know it's a human right and it's also kind of what makes life worth living in many ways so we've designed a lot of children out but we need to be designing children back in so 
planning has quite a lot to do with play and I think it's kind of waking up to that now. Some of our early planning ideas actually were kind of quite good about sort of being community centered and walking and cycling and and things like that but now we kind of live in quite quite different kinds of spaces where car movement has been yeah a really kind of major major consideration um and so yeah play needs to be more involved in kind of everything and rather than just kind of a a land use where children are allowed to be children they need to be allowed to be children everywhere they live (laughs) So not just giving them one specific place to be, they, they, are, they can and should be using everywhere. I think that's really interesting. Children play anywhere and everywhere unless we stop them. And the thing is that planning is often stopping them um, and or our environments are suggesting that adults should be stopping them. But if we look at an actual, rather than just a playground, we look at like a playful environment, you know, children will be like um, climbing up on the walls, jumping, skipping, like all of the nature that's around that's kind of another potential you know affordance of play and yeah we're prescribing it way too much and I think that's part of a a bit of a planning mentality which there's nothing wrong with it it's just the way planning has to be but a kind of a planning mentality that this has to be for that and it has to be very defined but play is kind of undefined so it's a bit of a challenge but it's something that planning kind of needs to enable but not actually try to designate too specifically. (laughs) Definitely. So it's not just about, oh, if we put something to play on here, children will play on it because children will play on anything if they're allowed to. Yeah, I think that's really important. exactly. And I think that's really important in terms of like, adults can't make these decisions. They can't imagine how children will play in these spaces. And that, to some extent, is why it's so important that children and young people have a voice in planning and the local area. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, they are they are more imaginative on average than adults. And um, so they, you know, there's so many reasons that they should be involved. But one key thing is that often if you go and talk to adults about planning, um, you'll get met with a lot of constraints. We can't do this because of that. We can't do that because of this. Um, or kind of focusing on kind of the way things have always been. So, you know, oh, but I, I need to be able to park my car. Um, this This road has too much traffic but children are much more likely to come up with the sort of the opportunities and be a bit freer from that structured way of thinking we've all gotten gotten used to. So involving them is is good in so many ways because they open up these other opportunities and sometimes involving the children and then showing, you know, the adults what the children have done. It helps us to get out of that kind of fixed mindset of what is into kind of what could be. Um, But also obviously like children, we talk quite a lot about children being kind of, Um, you know, citizens of the future, or we need to involve them because they're going to be experiencing it for the longest period of time. And in many ways, that's true. But I think the thing we often forget is that there are also current citizens that have needs and rights in the here and now, and are actually fully competent social agents when it comes to being children. So if you want an expert on being a child, then you have to talk to a child. um, And they, they can tell you about, you know, what it's like to be them, how they move around, what could be better, so it helps us to create places that work for them now and in the future. And it also helps us as professionals to think beyond the limits of what we're used to, um, especially, you know, as we face all sorts of kind of what we think of as kind of intractable challenges like climate change, and, you know, even more widely things like political polarization. Just children aren't, aren't sort of bogged down by all of these constraints. And we, we need to be thinking more imaginatively and you know, play is how we do that. Um, So children are kind of great at it and they need the results to work for them too. Yeah, for for sure. So if we are going to involve children in this planning to do all these amazing, imaginative and new ways of living, what would you say would be the first steps in in trying to consult with children, young people on their local area? I think the, the key thing is trying to not make it too much of a consultation in the way that we think of consultation. So it's not, I have an idea that I need to run past you to either confirm my idea or to tweak it around <laughs> the edges. Um, but what is it that children and young people actually need want to be telling us? So we can make all sorts of assumptions about what we think they want and what we think they need. But if we can kind of try to get out of that frame to start with what do they want to tell us I think that's a good starting point and um, so keeping it you know not not too defined from the start but I think it's also really important that we we start with a really clear purpose so you know what do we actually want to get out of this not not just kind of like we need to do this because 
consulting with children and young people is something that is is important but you know are we going to change something from it what can the actual influence be and um, how do we make this as meaningful as possible and how do we also communicate that to the young people because they kind of need clarity in what the outcome is going to be because that's it's motivating for them to know what's actually possible and um, it's also it's only fair in a rights-based perspective to to make it clear to them but um yeah it's it we also have a bit of a habit i think as adults of when we go and talk to children and young people we kind of feel like i don't think we even do it deliberately but we kind of feel like oh i'm an adult so i'm here to educate the children so then i think that there can be a bit of a trap that you get into a mindset of okay before i can um work with them on this i need to tell them about what a local development plan is how that fits with the national planning <laughs> framework how that fits with you know scottish government's national outcomes um you know exactly what a planner does because they might want to be a planner when they're older and we start to get into this trap of making it kind of more about educating them than getting their views so i think trying to work out what is it we actually want how do we make sure that we're genuinely getting their viewpoints and not accidentally just trying to educate them on what we do and what we think is important um, and kind of just manage to step step back out of it use kind of appropriate language and yeah just think about all of the ways that will keep them properly informed about the process and don't accidentally disillusion them by making them think that you know massive change can happen from what they say when actually it might not be possible but they may well be able to understand that um, and to contribute anyway definitely and i think you know that almost works for adults as well like lots of adults don't want to do consultations because we know sometimes things won't change whereas if you're told mm -hmm. this is for the specific change you, you're much more likely to contribute and know how to contribute because there's a specific outcome you're trying to influence rather than just oh here are my thoughts on something so i think that's really really interesting and really important that sort of you just have to move away from an adult-led agenda it can't just be here's what we want from you yeah. or here's what i need to tell you which is all you know <laughs> definitely yeah an issue and i think that that kind of starts to answer my next question which is about gathering authentic responses from children and young people so like you said it's not like we want to build this park do you think we should build it yes or no you know mm -hmm. it's like how, how do we get authentic responses how do we hear from them in a way that isn't just ticking the box we need to tick yeah i think that's yeah kind of like what you were saying there about you know is this the right approach kind of to build this park or whatever or you know here are 15 different pieces of play equipment what do you think of them like that's not that's you'll get a response children will always answer your questions pretty much like children go through school being told they're meant to please adults so usually if you ask them something they'll respond yeah. it might be a weird answer but... it might be a weird answer but they will try to respond to you they'll try to make you happy so um they'll probably tell you what they think you want to hear so um yeah you know an example is go rather than kind of going in and saying what do you think about play and go in and just go what do you like to do because if we go in and we start using the word play children are already can be kind of primed by what we think of as play so playing sports going to the playground but if you go what do you like to do well then you get a much broader range of responses which actually fit with the real definition of play which is much more much freer um, and varied um, and in terms of doing doing um, engagement that really focuses on authentic responses on the local environment, I think you really need to kind of ground it in their lived experience of place. So just don't, don't bring in anything abstract at all. You might be able to bring it in later on, depending on your group, but don't ever start with the abstract. Don't ever start with, you know, what, what do we think about climate change adaptation for our place? Like it's just, it's too, it's too big. So start with kind of their lived experience and find ways to uh, actually just put them in charge, try to sort of facilitate a discussion that helps them to see that their experience is the most important thing here and that they don't need to think about what other people think. It's just about what is what are things like for them. So a really, really useful way to do it that works really well, I think, just across the age range um, is to base it around mapping. So what we would often do is uh, start by getting the children or young people to design like a tour of the local area so we'd ask them you know what's what's important or what's good about your area they'd you know come up with a list or they'd put things on the map and then we'd go well how can we create a little 
tour from this and then we'd go out with them they could take us on that tour show us what's important and what could be better what's missing we talked to them about it on the way so that also you know often as a facilitator um it might be that you know the area that the children are from it might be that you actually really don't you can engage in a better discussion if they show you as well but you know if you do it that kind of way and then you can kind of come back and you can put everything together on a map we find that they're surprisingly good at using maps even children and young people that aren't that used to using maps if it's a map of their place it's often quite motivating to work it out um, and you know you can do things to help them get to grips with what it all means by you know often children want to plot on their, their homes onto the map or you know where their granny lives where their childminder lives um, and you can kind of bring it to life by having this this discussion that is actually out in the community and then actually on a physical representation of their place and then you know it might be that after that you can go into the more abstract kind of things or it might be that you know the it's not appropriate to do so but all the same you have this kind of much more grounded experience of what it's like to be them what they need to tell you rather than what you want to ask them um, and from there there's all sorts of different directions you can go you can build up from that in different ways you can have different exercises about okay well what is it if there are things we want to change how could we change them um, often we'd work with children and young people to find their priorities um, and kind of try to you know work with them to sort of see well what's the highest priority and um, what things do we all agree on what things do only some of us agree on and generally we find that uh, children and young people get really really into it because it's all about stuff that they are more of an expert on than you are and so it really just puts them in the driver's seat for sure that's so interesting and i love the idea of doing the tour because you know that's really they they know their way around to some extent you know even if you're driven lots of places you still know where the park is you still know where the shop is and you know oh this pavement's quite narrow that's not so good if my mum has the buggy with her as well and those are all the things that you probably it'd be very difficult if you were just sitting in a room asking questions it'd be very difficult to get that sort of information from a child but doing that sort of active thing where they get to show you like I think that's such an, a, a good way of doing it. Um, I was wondering if you had, they, they're such good tips. I was wondering if you had any other specific tips on running a consultation. Yeah, in, I guess in many ways, don't call it a consultation. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's that's not, not meant to be um, a slight, but I, I think that, uh, yeah, you know, it, it's more of a kind of an engagement trying to find out from them. And I think that that can kind of make it a bit more, enjoyable uh, rather than again you know just I am the expert and have a look at my opinions and let me know if you want them tweaked <laughs> and uh, yeah I, I think a key thing is just trying to keep it as playful as possible so especially when it comes to uh, younger children but I think you know we even as adults we would prefer it to be playful wouldn't we even yeah. if we wouldn't why call would you it say that. no I want it to be less fun please thank you <laughs> can you make this drier for yeah. me please more writing yeah. <laughs> so yeah I think keeping it kind of playful so you know for instance with the the kind of going out on a tour it might be that um in primary school say you might uh, I think the way that we've done it a little bit before is to say you know imagine uh I'm about to join P4 you know, I, I I used to live somewhere else. I'm coming here. Like, I need you to show me what it's like to be here and all of the things that I need to know um, so that, you know, I can fit into the school um, and, you know, we can become friends. That, you know, that kind of thing. Just bring it into a kind of a playful example so they're really seeing it as like I'm trying to show a child around, not necessarily I'm trying to show an adult how much I know about the place. That's really, <laughs> that's really yeah, because sometimes you might just get like a list of facts that they learn about their local area in a geography class, but what does what would you need to know if you wanted to be me almost is kind of yeah. yeah that's really clever yeah so it's things like that or or it's like if you're going to come up with a design with um children you know something that we found is if you kind of frame it around okay well we're we're here to do a job you know we've recruited you as our our designers um you know we're we're now colleagues um, so this is this is a job. The stakes are, you know, really important. And um, you know, teamwork is really important in a job. How are we going to work together? And kind of, you know, often defining the ways that you're going to do things with the children and young people, where they've kind of had an input in like the ground rules or like the principles that we're going to work from. And that often 
works really well because they're actually really good at that stuff like they can tell you how you work together well as a team and then you've got your list of rules and then you all follow those rules and then you know if someone doesn't you go oh but do you remember these rules we came up with together and it's much better than a sort of top down i am the adult i know how to behave you don't <laughs> kind of approach to things i think also just giving them a chance to kind of lead and facilitate the process so something that we've done um as far as we can in our projects is to kind of get, get the young people to facilitate their own groups. So, um, you know, sometimes we need to bring in specific kind of rules of how you facilitate something just to kind of get them started, but we'd always kind of work out if that's the best way with them. So, you know, it might be like you appoint a facilitator for the table whilst you do a little exercise and they're told, you know, it's, it's your, your job to make sure that everyone gets a chance to speak. Um, to remind everyone that, you know, no one is right or wrong. Some people have differences of opinion. Just try to listen out. Maybe it changes yours. Maybe it doesn't. That's okay. Yeah, we're not trying to get to the right answer. We're just trying to kind of get everyone's um, view. So, yeah, often then we find that um, they enjoy that they've kind of been given that role. And um, they might even be able to rotate that kind of within a group. They'll get a bit of a go at being a facilitator. But also it means that um, the process just runs itself <laughs> in many ways. You know, it's like it's you have a much more cohesive conversation and the young people kind of are more confident about, yeah, I'm the facilitator, so I'm going to tell you what my group sort of thought. So I think any any way that you can find to put them in charge to lead the process as well, it's motivating for them and it leads to a better conversation. So the feedback you're getting from groups there and from the maps that you make together, that's that's really rich and authentic sort of data. But I suppose um, I was wondering what advice you would give in sort of how to summarise that sort of data. You know, it's, it's very different from if you just did a multiple choice survey, you've got, you've got a lot of information there. Yeah, so what advice would you give on, on how to summarise it? Yeah, so I think, he, yeah, you raise a really important point. I think that thing of the, yeah, with the survey, you get your responses like really like nicely, clearly analysed in front of you. But I think the thing that you don't get with that is the so what or what happens next. So you might get, oh, you know, 40% of children think this, 40% think that, 20% don't know. And you go, well, okay, so it's it's split. What do we do? Um, but the benefits of doing something that's more participatory is that you ask the the children and the young people that you're working with you know you you get them to determine what's important um so you focus on kind of priorities together you know as i said we we often do kind of priorities for action and thing is that that is a really good reflective discussion on you know what everything we've spoken about what does it mean to you if we could wave a magic wand what would be the first thing that we would do um you know if we had um, unlimited money what what would we do you know, what do the, the boys think we should do? What do the girls think we should do? Is there something that actually, you know, the 12 year olds think is more important than the 11 year olds? So you, you have this discussion of what it all means with the children. And then when you have this kind of, you create like a list of priorities, well then that's, that's the key summary that you need to put into your consultation. Um, and also just, if you are making a map, the map is already a good summary. It's really visual. It's much easier for anyone to kind of interpret, um, you know, adult or not, what actually came out of your consultation. So, yeah, I, I would say that if you map it, then that's already a summary. And if you get priorities, that's already a summary. But the, the key thing is doing it with the children and young people to really highlight kind of what's important. So if you've done an engagement with children and young people, it's and summarised the evidence with them and checked with them that that's what they said we should then make sure their, wor their words are heard. You know, it's not just about collecting them. We've got to do something about it and tell the people who can do things about it. So. Absolutely, because we don't want to risk them becoming disillusioned by the process of always being asked and nothing ever happening. And to be honest, they already are a lot of them. You know, I've, if you speak to teenagers, you ask them, you know, why things won't change. They'll say it's because no one cares. You know, <laughs> they already know that, not, that often nothing really happens based on what they think. So we actually kind of want to try and change that viewpoint um, and have, have things change, but also actually raise aspirations a little bit and have, you know, a bit more, a bit more of an optimistic future that maybe we do care about what children and young people think and we can show them that and kind of we can improve places for them, but also for everyone. So if we want to create a future where we're listening to children and young people and what they say actually does impact actions and they're not disillusioned in that way. What will that future look like? 
I think it would be a much more inclusive future. Um, I think you know we would have stronger communities because you know children getting out and about and playing it brings life to communities i know you get some some people that don't like the sound of children playing or complain but i actually don't think that's the majority i think that's just the people that shout loudly and you know a lot of people in our towns and cities and things actually just feel really disconnected and lonely and a lot of the research shows it you know when you have children out and about it actually it forms those connections it brings a bit of joy um and also, adults like to play. We just don't like to admit it. We don't like to use the words play. Places that work for children, I think they're more likely to work for everyone. And I think for the kind of the, the future of our species in many ways, we need, we need to really be nurturing the youngest, especially in our kinds of our times of sort of difficulty and feeling like there's so many things that we need to solve, so many issues that require urgent action. Well, in, in many ways, the answer is a bit more lateral than literal it's kind of we need to play around with it a little bit we need to kind of actually take a step back and you know problem solve the way children problem solve which is through play fantastic well thank you so much for coming on our podcast this was really excellent thank you so much thank you thank you for joining us on this podcast Next time, we will be looking at how important policy and partnerships are in planning for play. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on your preferred app and join the conversation by using the hashtag PlayWellPodcast. And to find out more about Play Scotland, follow us on Twitter at PlaySCotland and visit our website, playscotland.org.